And let's go ahead and turn to Proverbs 29, verse 25. We're going to have two texts tonight, Proverbs 29, 25, and then John 12. I am going to reference quite a few different ones because this is a topic that is all over Scripture, but we'll uh, just basically camp out in these two to start. John, or yeah, Proverbs 29 and then John 12. So let's uh, stand for the reading of God's word. We'll start with Proverbs 29, 25, and then we'll flip to John 12. Proverbs 29, verse 25. These are the words of God. Trembling before man brings a snare, but he who trusts in Yahweh will be set securely on high. In John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, that is Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory of men rather than the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Father and blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in the grace of your Savior, Jesus Christ. And amen. You can be seated. Well, last week we kicked off our new series, Life Together, by examining how community works, and more specifically, uh, what or who, in this case, unites us, and what obligations come as a result of said unity. I printed out some more of those sheets, and, and they're there in the back if you would like to take one. Uh, we went over those uh, from John Owen, and that's uh, just a helpful reminder of the obligations, what, what comes in, in behind that unity that we have in Christ. And it is Christ, I argued, that uh, who unites his people. Uh, not programs and, and budgets and buildings and coffee bars. Um, further, we are called upon to guard and keep this bond of peace as self-governed, responsible creatures united by and united into covenant. The fruit of the gospel the Holy Spirit applies to you, and that fruit is meant to be exhibited and it is meant to be distributed to others. But there are certain things that can get in the way of communal, communi communal life or community, correct? There are some things that can uh, serve as a blockage to that. Rather than contributing to the health of the community, it is possible to contribute unhealthy things. I think that's rather obvious. Uh, Bonhoeffer writes, If my sin appears to me to be in any way smaller or less reprehensible in comparison with the sins of others then I am not yet recognizing my sin at all. So within the context of community, there is no doubt that sin, which of course we know arises in the hearts of men, it can spill over, it can spill out, you can make, you can make a mess, you can affect others because of that. We know that that is a possible thing. And it doesn't even have to be sin either. Um, it could be sin, and oftentimes it is, but it also could be foolishness. Sometimes just simple foolishness can clog things up as well. And moreover, uh, vaguely saying sin without identifying its roots doesn't really help things either. So perhaps the most pernicious sin that disrupts any community is what we're going to talk about tonight, but that is the, the problem of man-pleasing. Uh, the Puritans would call it man-pleasing or flesh-pleasing. Uh, us moderns, we talk more in terms of people-pleasing. Pop psychology defines it as putting the needs of others before yourself. Very simple definition. Now, you might think, well, what's wrong with that? We probably should. Indeed, certainly the Bible encourages us to do, quote, nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves. That is Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. So, it's, it's not a problem to put the needs of others ahead of yours. It could be a problem, though. There is, however, a great danger in having an undue, inordinate desire for approval, which is actually coupled with a fear of rejection. 
kind of a two-pronged thing, two sides of the same dangerous coin. You are treading on thin ice if you have a, an unshakable longing for approval in the eyes of those around you. The, the flip side to this people-pleasing coin is, is an unhealthy fear of rejection. Or perhaps it's actually a fear of not being accepted, which is why you want to be accepted by people so you uh, look for approval. Now, in social psychology, some of the studies that are out there, the phenomenon is usually referred to as sociotropy or sociotropy, depending on if you're from England or not. <laughs> and that's described as an excessive and harmful need for social acceptance. An excessive and harmful need for social acceptance. Almost the complete opposite concept as autonomy and independence. So rather than wanting to be autonomous and independent in your own regard, you have an unhealthy desire to be accepted. So everything drives you to that. Some people would rather do their own lone wolf thing. Others are driven by, I have to be accepted and I will do whatever it takes. If that means lying, cheating, stealing, you name it. Now, those who are caught in, in its grip oftentimes have codependency difficulties, um, always needing others because that's where identity is found. There are obviously degrees to this man-pleasing, as the Puritans called it, or flesh-pleasing, people-pleasers tend to be overly sensitive to social dynamics. Overly sensitive to social dynamics. They struggle to communicate and advocate for themselves um, while being unduly concerned with feelings of acceptance from others. Uh, oftentimes they have a hard time saying no. They are bothered by how people might perceive them rather than enjoying conversation. Oftentimes people-pleasers, they will survey the room and they try to keep tabs on everything and everyone, and they want to be in with everyone, which usually means they aren't in with anyone. Sometimes they have a very low view of themselves. They don't, you know, they fail to appreciate the image of God which marks them out as his creature. Other times they are so consumed with others that they have no concept of personal holiness or sanctification. Sin basically becomes an exercise of excuse-making or minimization and outright denial. Driven by insecurity, people-pleasers are prone to apologizing for everything, for fear of potentially upsetting someone, anyone, for a decision that they have made or even a decision that they are about to make. Instead of letting his yes be yes or her yes be yes and her no be no, the very thing the Bible commands of us, their hypersensitivity, or we should say their hypersensitive reactivity, doesn't allow for such definitive answers like yes and no. Yes, yes is far too difficult. No is far too difficult. As fence riders, they are usually agreeable to everything, usually agreeable to everything for fear of being rejected should they disagree, which means you don't really know their opinion on anything. Because they might tell you one thing and tell the friend another thing, and you don't really know. You might be a people pleaser if you are a chameleon. You're willing to tell people what you think they want to hear rather than what you actually think about something. Uh, usually there's social jockeying. Well, this person wants me to say this. I know they would want me to say this, so I'm going to go ahead and say that, even though it's not really what you feel deep down in your heart and think deep down in your mind. There are certainly, obviously, I think it goes without saying, there certainly is a time for being sympathetic and empathetic uh, towards one another. We should be thoughtful people, after all, right? I mean, it's a good thing to be thoughtful. However, those who are stuck on the people-pleasing treadmill have a low view of God. Oftentimes, they have a low view of self with it, and they have an inability to find true peace and contentment. There's a fine line between doing something out of genuine care and doing something with a heart filled with pride and a mouth full of guile. Proverbs 26, 24 through 25 reads, He who hates disguises it with his lips, but he sets up deceit within himself. When he makes his voice gracious, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. So, Scripture warns us of two things. One, Beware of the silent one who does not clearly communicate, and beware of the noisy one who does not clearly communicate, communicate either. Proverbs 10.19, uh, we're going to come back to this in another week, but 
Proverbs 10.19 reads, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. Let your words be few. When there are many of them, transgression is unavoidable. People-pleasing is far more than a social problem. It's actually a theological problem. We've been talking some of the social dynamics to set this up, but it's actually a theological problem as well. Because of sin, insecurity has entered into the human, human populace, and as a result, our hearts become unstable, our hearts become unsure, and our hearts become unconfident. A, 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 a thrice unholy problem for the human heart. As justified in Christ, yet still battling sin people, we are prone to double-mindedness. We're prone to double-mindedness, and thus we are prone to fakery, and we are prone to man-pleasing as a fruit of that. The direction of the human heart goes one of, one of two ways, and pertinent to our discussion today, it can be said to be pointed in these two ways. First, the human heart can be latched onto God with a healthy reverence and fear and trembling of God, or second, it can be latched onto self with an unhealthy fear of man. I love what Bavink wrote. He said, both excessive love of and contempt for human beings is wrong. Two ditches. Excessive love of, and he's speaking, of course, in, helpfully in our context, and contempt for human beings is, is wrong. Each of us has a responsibility to worship and serve God as he is, seeking to please him above all else. That is the de facto position of everyone who confesses Christ. Your job in life is to please God first and foremost. And thanks to his son, you can do it. And it is a thing that can be accomplished. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But we need to be able to, to come to that conclusion. We all are tasked with worshiping and serving God as he is. Not as we wished him to be, but as he is. And we want to please him above all else. You may disappoint people. You may disappoint the person next to you, behind you, in front of you. But if that disappointment comes because you are trying to please God above all else, then so be it. Furthermore, each of us also has a responsibility to love, serve, and bear with one another, but only when it's set within the confines of God's judicial determinations. So you need to know what God's word says in order to understand what it is that God expects of us. And that's kind of what we talked about last week. There are God-given rules and patterns for going about interpersonal relationship, again, last week. But we are, we are not free to create our own standards. We are not free to create our own standards with pride at its root and displace a fear of God with a fear of man. We are not free to, to revel in our insecurities. We are not free to create our own social psychology. We are not free to perpetuate an unhealthy, sinful fear of man. That, that's off limits. We're not free to do that. And to do so is sin, and sin, of course, requires repentance. Now, pop psychology, it's one of those things that sometimes they get things right just because they're made in the image of God. They sometimes get things right. They'd often undervalue the real problem with man being sin, and therefore usually it's something else. Blame your parents, you know, that's it. <laughs> There's more to it. And you can read uh, Rush Judy's Revolt Against Maturity to see some of that. But pop psych psychology does get some things right. They have some helpful, helpful tips, but unless you get to the root, unless you get to the root of it all, you'll never actually change this unhealthy, sinful disease. And we'll call it a spiritual disease. Now let's look at our two texts. Start in Proverbs 29. Verse 25. Trembling before man brings a snare. Trembling before man brings a snare. But he who trusts in Yahweh will be set securely on high. If you have an ESV in your lap, you have a verse that says, The fear of man lays a snare. Uh, the LSB has chosen to translate the Hebrew word there as trembling, which I really, really like because I think it really gets to the heart of the word. Uh, fear tends to be misunderstood. We have that conversation with kids all the time because fear is, what do we mean by fearing God? Or what are we supposed to do with that? Does that mean we're supposed to be scared of God? Well, maybe, maybe scared from a position of assurance because he's holy and we're, we've sinned against him. Maybe there's that level. But 
Or does fear actually mean that we're supposed to simply revere him and respect him? And so I, you know, I think trembling is a great choice here because you could almost translate it as well, quaking. Quaking before men lays a snare. Trembling before men. Being so devastated by the other that you're shaking in your boots. To tremble before men brings a snare. It's a baited lure. It entraps you like a wild animal caught in a snare. If we trust Yahweh, the Bible says, we are safe and secure. And in the next verse, it says that seeking the face of a ruler for justice doesn't work unless it's justice is seen as something that comes from God. So there's kind of a two verses that kind of go together. But the point here is that having an unhealthy fear of and trembling for man and before men, mere mortals, <laughs> is not safe, Scripture warns. It's not safe. But it's actually, not only is it not safe, it's something that traps you, it makes you vulnerable to destruction. That is the imagery of a trapped wild animal. Matthew Henry writes this, he said, Many are ashamed to own Christ now, and he will not own them in the day of judgment. But he that trusts in the Lord will be saved from this snare. Uh, putting it in the t- context of confessing Christ, uh, many, many in the early church would be told, do you follow the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you do, we will kill you. What are you going to say in that moment? And many were persecuted. Many were burned at the stake. Many were thrown to the, to the lions in the Colosseum. But do you tremble before men or do you tremble before God? That's really where the rubber meets the road here. Christ must be treasured, must be held up as supreme and valued above all if one is to escape the trap of man-pleasing. Jesus tells us in Luke 12 that we ought not to fear the one who can destroy the body, but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In other words, don't fear the devil and certainly don't fear men. Fear God most and above all. King Saul, King Saul found himself trapped after failing to obey Yahweh. You remember that he was to put everyone to death when they went to war, but he left one of the kings alive. The prophet Samuel confronted Saul. Samuel went to, to Saul and said that God had rejected you. God's rejected you as king over Israel because you didn't listen. And Saul confessed in 1 Samuel 15, 24. We often forget this, but here's what he said. He confessed that he feared the people instead of fearing God. Samuel confronted Saul. Saul feared the people more than he feared God, and thus he lost the kingdom. Destruction ensued. Flip to the New Testament, John chapter 12. Some of the religious leaders were believing on Jesus. However, they were half-hearted believers. Look at our text again, verse 42. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers, the religious leaders, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory of men rather than the glory of God. So why is it that these men, who were a part of the religious elite of the day, They were confessing him, but not in front of the Pharisees. Why were they half-hearted? Well, one, they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue, the text says. Their social standing was far too important to them, right? Fear of rejection is strong, is it not? Many of us can fall into that. A fear of not being liked, loved, not feeling like you're worth enough to others. Fear of rejection, though, in this case, is a very strong thing. Their social standing meant more to them than Jesus who stood before them. Second reason is because they loved the glory of men rather than the glory of God. Curiously, they did not have the courage to confess their faith openly because, shocker, they feared men. (laughs) You remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He was one of the rulers. In fact, he was there to help take Jesus' body off the cross and bury him in the tomb. So eventually, Nicodemus made the right decision and we don't know necessarily where he's at in this but there may have been other religious leaders who who thought this jesus is the real deal he's the messiah but if i say anything i lose everything and what did jesus tell us about that (laughs) 
you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you want your life, you need, you need to lose it now in order to gain it for the kingdom. Now, the power and prestige of men are like shackles that prevent someone from truly living. Show me the man who is unfettered by the opinion of others, and I'll show you a man who is living as God intends. Unfettered by the opinions of others. Earlier in John chapter 5, we find that Jesus did not accept glory from men, a sure way to stave off the sin of people-pleasing, don't accept their glory. Um, Undoubtedly, it is true, let others praise you, right? Uh, That's an important lesson, kids, as you grow in wisdom and maturation. Let others tell you how great you are about something. You know, don't, don't walk into the room, I'm super humble and I'm awesome at this thing. Nice to meet you. Uh, let others praise you. That is true. Here's the thing, though. Let others praise you, but don't overvalue their praise. Don't overvalue that praise. In fact, we're told in Matthew chapter 6 to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and not the glory that comes from man. That is the great temptation. The, the great temptation, and, and this, this is like... All these like mega church guys who keep falling and crashing and burning, it's like I'm pretty sure God hates what we're doing here. Maybe that's part of the problem here. But but you know when you get millions of downloads because your sermons are so epic, and 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 you're just like you're doing it. You're, you know you're in. Can't speak out about anything, but you know you're at least tickling ears. That's glory for men, and it's a serious trap. And it'll lure you in quick. So don't seek those things first. Who or what we value or fear dictates the outcome of our relationships. Note that. Who or what we value or fear dictates the outcome of our relationships. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6, that high reputation doesn't matter. God shows no partiality. God is not impressed if you were president of the United States at one point. Not impressive. God shows no partiality. He is no respecter of persons. In Ephesians 5.10, we are told to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, the implication being that this is what matters more than learning what is pleasing to men. Learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And if you focus yourself on that, you won't fall into this trap. You won't love the glory of men more than the glory of God. Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When a man's ways are pleasing to Yahweh, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. People pleasers have enemies despite their desired outcome of having no enemies. That's the irony of it. I don't want any enemies, so I'm going to play the field. I'm going to tell people what they want to hear. I'm going to do all this. And then it's like, oh, I actually have created enemies because they all think I'm a liar or I'm double-minded, half-hearted, nitwit, right? That's... That's, that's what, so you actually end up with enemies. But God pleasers, Proverbs says, God pleasers have enemies that are at peace with him. So there is a difference here. So how, how do we live in light of these texts? Several texts, there's even more. I just didn't want to give you all of them. <laughs> how do we live? People pleasing is a trap for five reasons. And there are more. And I'm just trying to summarize it in my own way here, but there are lots of things. Some of those books that we recommended are just great. I just want to boil it down to these five things. First, it's a trap because it substitutes man in place of God. Already you're on the wrong foot, right? It substitutes man in place of God. We're supposed to ultimately fear, trust, believe on, have faith in, and tremble towards the living God and not men. That's the biblical pattern. Uh, ultimately to fear him, to tremble before him. We're also supposed to, to please, adore, desire the praise of, value, speak well of, and render service to God over and above men as well. People pleasers undervalue and thus they underappreciate the freedom the Bible provides in establishing proper boundaries for relationships. And as a result, they are ironically going the route of autonomy. And the reason they're going the route of autonomy is because they refuse to submit to God's law word as the standard that it is. It's a trap because it substitutes man in place of God. John Witherspoon said, it is, the, it is only the fear of God that can deliver us from the fear of man. 
and it is absolutely correct. Pleasing the Lord above all else is the call of every Christian. Every day, your aim is to please the Lord above all else. And how do we please the Lord? We're going to get into some of that in a little bit, but first and foremost, you should desire him. <laughs> you should desire his glory more than the glory of men. You should desire, you should run to him in prayer. You should run to his word if you want to hear from God. That's how you hear from him. You should want his opinion over the opinions of men, the opinions of the world, even. So if you want to escape that trap, you have to undo the substitution of man in place of God and put man back in his, in his proper place. Please the Lord above all else. That's the call of every single Christian. And it matters what God thinks far more than what man thinks. Because we are mere mortals and we can be wrong. What does God say? That's the primary motivation. And to reverse this is to substitute man in place of God, and thus we have an idol. The second thing, second, people-pleasing is a trap because it promotes false peace. Jeremiah would prophesy against the false peace that was going on in his day, and we can also do the same in our day. It's a trap because it promotes false peace. Rather than being at peace with God and men, in that order, man-pleasing creates a veneer of peace. But since no one knows where the man-pleaser actually stands, because he or she's a chameleon, there really is no peace to be found. There is only anger, frustration, uh, relational consternation, um, irritability is another result, and even stress. Instead of being at peace, man-pleasers become slaves to others. And when you are a slave to another man, you will easily be driven by turmoil and anxiety. Could there be peace in a relationship when one party fears being reject rejected and exaggerates, minimizes, or even hides their own willpower and viewpoints? Could you possibly have peace? Could you have peace with your friend when you sit down for coffee and you just don't know what they really think? because they told you one thing and you heard it from somebody else. Let's give the best spin on it. It wasn't gossipy. You heard from somebody else that actually they were thinking this. How do you even know? There's no peace there. There's no peace in the relationship. Can there be peace with man pleasers when they are willing to do anything and everything to be accepted by others? Can there be peace in a relationship when pride is at the root? Man-pleasers do not see their sin, nor do they see the damage they are causing. Thus, there is no peace. There is only false peace, pretend peace. And here's the thing. When there is a lack of, of authenticity, a, lo a lack of authenticity or, or genuineness that, that ought to mark all of us, when there's a lack of that, there can only be this temporary illusion of peace. If, if you don't have the peace of Christ in your life, no amount of flattery and people-pleasing will give you that peace. Third, people-pleasing is a trap in that it reaps negative consequences. I just mentioned the self-inflicted inner turmoil that's foisted upon the man-pleaser, but there are other negative consequences that come along with this. Pride causes this type of person to minimize their sin and their folly while exaggerating and inflating their own virtuousness. You know, what I did or what I said wasn't that bad, but here's what I do to serve the church, right? So we play that game of like minimizing the, the devastating effects of sin, but elevating our own perceived value and worth, and we create this problem with others especially. Uh, pride, we know, begets more pride, and the inner life wastes away. Pride is something like bitterness that will eat at your soul. Uh, bitterness tends to be a little bit more like physically nauseating. Pride tends to just puff up. You don't notice its effects as much. But pride begets more pride, and your inner life wastes away. How do you know you have too much pride in your life? How do you know? Because, I mean, there is a level of, of pride in terms of accomplishment and sense of belonging and service to the kingdom, no doubt. But we know what we're talking about here. 
pride in the sense of autonomy, self-righteousness, glorying of man and myself. That pride. How do you know you have too much pride in your life? Are you ungrateful to God? If something good happens to you, do you pause immediately go to God and glorify him for it? Whose hand of providence is are making it happen? Uh, are you grateful to are you ungrateful? <laughs> um, that may be a sign of, of pride in your life if you're ungrateful to God. Are you prone to speak instead of listen? Um, oftentimes, we might look at someone and say, you're telling me about your problems, and you can keep talking, but I know the answer, because you're dumb. No, you're not, that's not, no, that would be the, not the best response. But you might think you're just being foolish, you're not thinking about this the right way, and you're, you just want to tell them, like, somebody tell them. Are you quick to want to speak, though, or are you, or are you quick to want to listen and be a good friend? And hear them out. And then say, well, have you thought about this? After they're done. And they ask you. uh, How do you know you have too much pride in your life? Do you fail to admit when you're wrong? Do you fail to admit when you're wrong? And, And I don't mean just mutter beneath your breath like, yeah, I was wrong. But go to the person and say, I was really wrong here. Because if you don't have the humility to, to admit that to someone, you have too much pride in your heart. Are you, we're still on the pride thing. <laughs> Are you genuinely, or excuse me, generally discontented with your present circumstances? Um, something to think through. Do you pray like it depends on God because it does? The number one reason we do not go to the Lord in prayer, in my view, I've said this before, but it's because we don't think we need him and we can do it. Uh, Do you struggle with being corrected? You may have too much pride in your heart. Are you hard to please because of a certain level of stubbornness that you exhibit towards others? We can go on and on. Accordingly, there are negative consequences. Those are negative consequences for you in your heart with pride and ego and self-righteousness and all those things. But there are other things that can affect others too. Uh, it can spill out, no doubt. Um, maybe you, you, you fall into the trap of flattery, both in giving it and receiving it. Um, one author said that gossip is saying things about someone you wouldn't say to their face, and flattery is saying something to someone's face that you wouldn't say behind their back. Man-pleasing tends to send mixed signals to others. Um, it tempts us to be indecisive, um, unsure. It tempts us to, to uh, well, it actually ends up that our leadership and wisdom can't really be trusted, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, it sets up unrealistic expectations. Um, can you please everyone all the time? No, you can't. It's impossible. Not even going to try. Can't do it. Is everyone going to reject you if only you would be honest with yourself and others? Is everyone going to reject you? No. No. I mean, it better not be in a church, right? Of all places, if you're honest and you have this struggle and you're you're flustered and you're, you know, you acted foolishly or yada yada, whatever the case is, and you admit that to someone and you're looking for guidance and wisdom, if they turn you away... We have not shown the love of Christ. Other negative consequences. It weakens relationships generally because the man pleaser will ultimately resent others like they resent themselves if you're caught into that deep despair. Uh, It distracts you from your God-given responsibilities because man pleasers are preoccupied with playing chess with others. They're the only ones playing chess. Nobody knows they're playing chess, but you're preoccupied with others um, when they should be homeschooling their children, focusing at work. The task that God has given us. Um, It also encourages excuse-making because man-pleasers won't assert themselves and tell the truth, so they search for reasons to escape the situation. Uh, People-pleasing inhibits decision-making because rather than asserting one's own priorities towards God, He or she will make the other supreme. And the negative consequences are legion, and this is why it's important to confront these things in a community like the church, the people of God. To to be truthful at all costs 
despite the possibility of letting someone down. To care deeply about the truth of God's word, the truth of what he expects of us, to care enough to say, this is the truth about the situation. You may hate me, but I'm looking to obey scripture. I'm, a, I'm looking to obey God in this situation. And if I'm wrong, because maybe I'm self-deceived and I think I'm obeying God, but actually I'm missing some other biblical principles to fill this thing out. Whatever it is, we should care about the truth. Listen to Bonhoeffer. He said this. The practice of discipline in the community of faith begins with friends who are close to one another. Words of admonition and reproach must be risked when a lapse from God's word in doctrine or life endangers a community that lives together. Did you catch that? Words of admonition and reproach. Encourage someone and rebuke them if necessary. He says it has to be a risk. It's a risk. Is it not a risk to confront someone about something? Because you're putting yourself out there and you're trusting God to guide you. Hopefully you've prayed about it, thought about it, sought wisdom um, before just doing it. He says it's got to be risked. Whenever there's a lapse from God's word in doctrine or life, that endangers the community. The sin of Achan in the book of Joshua endangered the community. So we have to risk that stuff. We have to be willing to risk it. He says nothing can be more cruel than that leniency which abandons others to their sin. You want to hate someone? Let them sin. Nothing can be more cruel, he says. Nothing can be more compassionate than that severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. There's no room for man-pleasing in that situation. There is love of God and love of friend who has walked that path and you need to bring them back. Fourth reason, people-pleasing is a trap because it cannot build trust. I'm going to take a whole week on that topic of building trust, mining the book of Proverbs especially, but it's a trap. This people-pleasing thing is a trap. You cannot build trust with people. Can anyone trust the double-minded or the half-hearted? If trust is future expectation based on past experience, as our uh, brother and friend uh, Tim Yarbrough says in Alabama, Great definition. Trust is future expectation based on past experience. If that's true and the past experience is a trail of wreckage due to man-pleasing, why would anyone trust you? Um, if you pretend to agree with someone, can you build trust? Can you? If you think you're responsible for how others feel, can you build trust? If you hide your true emotions about something, or your true thoughts, whatever, can you build trust? If you avoid all conflict at all costs for fear of rejection, can you build trust? If you go fishing for compliments, can you build trust? If you can never say no to someone, can you build trust? No. But... You can destroy trust in an instant. In an instant. It could take a long time to build it, but man, it's one of those things you can destroy right away. Fifth, and lastly, people-pleasing is a trap because it harms a community. Kind of, um, kind of in line with the, uh, the other point about the negative consequences, but I really want to focus on the community aspect. Rather than obsessing about how to please others, use your tongue to pray for them. Encourage them. Maybe even praise them. Right? Um, instead of constantly keeping an eye on others, judging them or criticizing them, condemning them, heck, doing violence in your heart towards them, use that time to open up the Bible and pray for them. It's funny, Jesus said to pray for your enemies, right? You would think that the bar was set so low that the first thing we would do for our friends is pray for them. When we do this, we can live freely. The masks can be removed, uh, literally and figuratively. Our hearts can be grounded in the word, and we can restore a true trembling before the living God. The Holy Spirit, thanks to the work of Christ, he brings us face to face with each other. Rather than turning our backs, we're in Christ. We're face to face with each other. 
The gospel restores the relationship that we, we, had with, we have with God, with creation, with ourselves, and with each other. And when we stop looking at one another through the eyes of faith, eyes that have been gripped by the glory of God, when we stop doing that, we will be tempted toward the sin of man-pleasing. And it can be passive, and it can be aggressive, and it can be passive-aggressive. Instead of giving ourselves to such uh, speculations, practice saying no. Practice saying no. And you don't even have to make an excuse. No, I'm not, I'm not able to, to join you on this, or I'm not able to do this. That's it. You don't have to say, well, i got a lot going on. We all do. Can we all agree we all have a lot going on? <laughs> Just no, I, I just, uh, sorry, we, we aren't able to, to join you. Have a great time. That's it. <laughs> Practice that. Um, also, here's the tip. Give yourself time to make a decision. Give yourself time to make a decision. Don't feel like you need to decide right away, right then and there. Give yourself time. Um, review what God would call you to do. That's a great opportunity to use that time. What is it that God has called me to do in this situation? Does it align with our priorities right now? All of us have different family priorities, right? We all have different things going on, different things we prioritize. That's okay. That's, that's your family mission. That's what you're doing. You, you stick to it. God's glorified and well, assuming it's righteous stuff, by the way. <laughs> but does, does this align with our priorities? And if it's not something that really works for us, then well, no, it's, it's, it's really okay. It's really okay. Um, perhaps you need to set better boundaries in your life. Um, a, a holy violence towards this temptation to sin and flesh-pleasing. Maybe you need to be able to set boundaries. But whatever the case, we would do well to listen to one another, actively help one another when there is a need. You want to please God? It starts here. Be in prayer. Look to his word. Align yourself with him. How do I serve the person across from me? What can I do today to do something that will be for the benefit of others? Bearing with their needs, praying for them, pulling them aside. Uh, you seem frustrated. Can we just pray about it? You don't even have to tell me. You know, like little things like that. Um, supporting one another. We would do well to view others through God's standards for Christian character and not our own standards. This is the biggest, one of the biggest things that can rip people apart. Judge the character of others based on God's standards, not yours. We would do well to practice genuine and true and deep and abiding forgiveness, too. Don't, uh, don't overvalue relationships, but don't undervalue them either. The Bible kind of puts us in that tension. Be content with what God has placed before you. Don't uh, avoid idealization land, fantasy land. Live, live with what God has put before you, the lot you have right in front of you, the responsibilities God has given you today. Don't let yourself go into the, the land of obscurity where you just wish this was the case and you just spend your day there. Don't. Stay where you're supposed to be. Um, we would do well to avoid gossip, and we would do well to avoid undue flattery. The good news is, friends, the sin of man-pleasing has been nailed to the cross. Christ is now your master, not men. Christ is your master, not men. You want to please God? Put that first. Christ is my master. I am a slave. I am a slave of Christ. I'm not a slave of men. Christ is now your wisdom and guidance, not men. Christ shows no partiality, but men do. In his book, Pleasing God, R.C. Sproul reminds us that the Lord is who we strive to please. Strive to please the Lord first. Anything that comes out of that to please others in a, in a positive servanthood sense has to come from there. Otherwise, you'll be guilty of trying to put the cart before the horse. After our failures, our sins, our foibles, and our foolishness, we rise up again in faith, striving more and more each day to please God by living and walking in his word light. There is, friends, forgiveness for this grave sin, and there is hope in the gospel. 
Richard Baxter writes this, and we're going to end here. This is a great quote. Richard Baxter, Puritan writer, you know, four or five hundred years ago. He said this, An humbled soul that have felt what it is to have displeased God and what it is to be under his curse and what it is to be reconciled to him by the death and intercession of Jesus Christ is so taken up in seeking the favor of God and is so troubled with every fear of his displeasure and is so delighted with the sense of his love as that he can scarce have while to mind so small a matter as the favor or displeasure of man. Little ancient in English here. You have displeased God. You're driven by a pleasing God. You're so delighted in who he is. Let's uh, just try to translate this. <laughs> there, there's no, there's no uh, foothold in your mind when you're, you're focused on the, the, the pleasure of God, pleasing God. There's no... It's nothing to try to please men. You're not given over because you're solely focused on pleasing God. He says, God's favor is enough for him. God's favor is enough for him. And so precious to him. That if he find that he hath this, so small a matter as the favor of man will scarce be missed by him. That's the antidote. It's Christ. It is in Christ we have this favor. We have the favor of God. We have the gospel. And in Christ we can have this peace. Cease striving for the approval of men. Cease fearing their, their rejection. Embrace Christ. Behold Christ. Find your peace in Him. There would be no room for any of this should you fear and tremble before the living God. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot to take in on this topic. Your word covers quite a vast array of instructions for us. And, and while we scratch the surface, I pray that as your word is proclaimed, that your spirit uh, would grab a hold of us, that your spirit would lead us to the well of truth that is your word. Father, as we sing and partake of communion, uh, as we go and, and, and eat together, Lord, we glorify and honor you help deliver us from any shred of man-pleasing. Help us be solely interested in pleasing you. And in Christ, we know we have that. So we celebrate that in Jesus' name. Amen.